Saint Gregory of Tours was a Gallo-Roman historian and bishop of Tours, which made him a leading prelate of Gaul. He was born Georgius Florentius, later adding the name Gregorius in honor of his maternal great-grandfather. He is the main contemporary source for Merovingian history. His most notable work was his Decem Libri Historiarum or Ten Books of Histories, better known as the Historia Francorum, a title given to it by later chroniclers, but he is also known for his accounts of the miracles of saints, especially four books of the miracles of Martin of Tours. Saint Martin's tomb was a major draw in the 6th century, and Gregory's writings had the practical aspect of promoting this highly organized devotion. Life. Gregory was born in Clermont, in the Auvergne region of central Gaul. He was born into the upper stratum of Gallo-Roman society as the son of Florentius, senator of Clermont, by his wife Armentaria II, niece of Bishop Nicetius of Lyons and granddaughter of both Florentinus, senator of Geneva, and Saint Gregory of Langres. Gregory had several noted bishops and saints as close relatives, and, according to Gregory, he was connected to 13 of the 18 bishops of Tours preceding him by ties of kinship. Gregory's paternal grandmother, Leocadia, descended from Vettius Epigatus, the illustrious martyr of Lyons. His father evidently died while Gregory was young and his widowed mother moved to Burgundy where she had property. Gregory went to live with his paternal uncle Street, Gallus, Bishop of Clermont, under whom, and his successor Street, Avatus, Gregory had his education. Gregory also received the clerical tonsure from Gallus. Having contracted a serious illness, he made a visit of devotion to the tomb of St. Martin at Tours. Upon his recovery, he began to pursue a clerical career and was ordained deacon by Avatus. Upon the death of Saint Euphronius, he was chosen as bishop by the clergy and people, who had been charmed with his piety, learning, and humility. Their deputies overtook him at the court of King Sigebert of Austrasia, and being compelled to acquiesce, though much against his will, Gregory was consecrated by Giles, Bishop of Rims, on the 22nd of August 573, at the age of 34. He spent most of his career at Tours, although he assisted at the Council of Paris in 577. The rough world he lived in was on the cusp of the dying world of antiquity and the new culture of early medieval Europe. Gregory lived also on the border between the Frankish culture of the Merovingians to the north and the Gallo-Roman culture of the south of Gaul. At Tours, Gregory could not have been better placed to hear everything and meet everyone of influence in Merovingian culture. Tours lay on the watery highway of the navigable Loire. Five Roman roads radiated from Tours, which lay on the main thoroughfare between the Frankish north and Aquitania, with Spain beyond. At Tours the Frankish influences of the north and the Gallo-Roman influences of the south had their chief contact. As the centre for the popular cult of St. Martin, Tours was a pilgrimage site, hospital, and a political sanctuary to which important leaders fled during periods of violence and turmoil in Merovingian politics. Gregory struggled through personal relations with four Frankish kings, Sigebert I, Chilpric I, Guntram, and Childebert II and he personally knew most of the leading Franks' works. Gregory wrote in late Latin, which departed from classical usage frequently in syntax and spelling with relatively few changes in inflection. History of the Franks, the Historia Francorum is in ten books. Books I to IV recount the world's history from the creation but move quickly to the Christianization of Gaul, the life and times of Saint Martin of Tours, the conversion of the Franks and the conquest of Gaul under Clovis and the more detailed history of the Frankish kings down to the death of Sigebert I in 575. At this date, Gregory had been Bishop of Tours for two years. The second part, Books V and Vi, closes with Chilpric I's death in 584. During the years that Chilpric held Tours, relations between him and Gregory were tense. After hearing rumours that the Bishop of Tours had slandered his wife, 
Chilperic had Gregory arrested and tried for treason, a charge which threatened both Gregory's bishopric and his life. The most eloquent passage in the Historia is the closing chapter of Book V, in which Chilperic's character is summed up unsympathetically through the use of an invective. The third part, comprising Books VII to X, takes his increasingly personal account to the year 591. An epilogue was written in 594, the year of Gregory's death. Problems of interpretation readers of the Historia Francorum must decide whether this is a royal history and whether Gregory was writing to please his patrons. It is likely that one royal Frankish house is more generously treated than others. Gregory was also a Catholic bishop, and his writing reveals views typical of someone in his position. His views on perceived dangers of Arianism led him to preface the Historia with a detailed expression of his orthodoxy on the nature of Christ. In addition, his ridiculing of pagans and Jews reflected how his works were used to spread the Christian faith. For example, in Book 2, chapters 28-31, he describes the pagans as incestuous and weak and then describes the process by which newly converted King Clovis leads a much better life than that of a pagan and is healed of all the conundrums he experienced as a pagan. Gregory's education was the standard Latin one of late antiquity. Focusing on Virgil's Aeneid and Martianus Capella's Liber de Nuptis Mercuriae Philologiae, but also other key texts such as Orosius Chronicles, which his Historia continues, and Sallust, he refers to all these works in his own. His education, as was typical for the time, did not extend to a broad acquaintance with the pagan classics but rather progressed to mastery of the Vulgate Bible. It is said that he constantly complained about his use of grammar. He did not understand how to correctly write masculine and feminine phrases, reflecting either a lack of ability or changes in the Latin language. Though he had read Virgil, considered the greatest Latin stylist, he cautions that we ought not to relate their lying fables lest we fall under sentence of eternal death. By contrast, he seems to have thoroughly studied the lengthy and complex Vulgate Bible, as well as numerous religious works and historical treatises, which he frequently quotes, particularly in the earlier books of the Historia. The main impression that historians once retained from the Historia focused on Gregory's anecdotes about violence, until recently. Historians tended to conclude that Merovingian Gaul was a chaotic, brutal mess. Recent scholarship has refuted that view. Through more careful readings, scholars have concluded that Gregory's underlying purpose was to highlight the vanity of secular life and contrast it with the miracles of the saints. Though Gregory conveys political and other messages through the Historia, and these are studied very closely, Historians now generally agree that this contrast is the central and ever-present narrative device. Hagiography His Life of the Fathers comprises 20 hagiographies of the most prominent men of the preceding generation, taking in a wide range the spiritual community of early medieval Gaul, including lives of bishops, clerics, monks, abbots, holy men and hermits. Saint. Elidius is praised for his purity of heart. Saint. Brachio the abbot for his discipline and determination in study of the scriptures. Saint Patroclus for his unwavering faith in the face of weakness. And Saint. Nicetius, bishop of Lyon, for his justice. It is the life of Saint. Nicetius of Trier, though, which dominates this book, his great authority and sense of episcopal responsibility which is the focus of Gregory's account as his figure, predestined to be great, bestrides the lives of the others. It is told that he felt a weight on his head, but he was unable to see what it was when turning around, though upon smelling its sweet scent he realized that it was the weight of episcopal responsibility. He surmounts the others in the glory of his miracles, and was chosen by God to have the entire succession of past and future Frankish kings revealed to him. A further aspect of this work to note is the appearance of Gregory himself in certain sections, notably in the life of Saint Leobardus. This is for two reasons. 
Firstly, it creates a distinct link between the temporal and the spiritual worlds, firmly placing the accounts of the lives in a world which is understandable and recognizable, or seen from the other angle, confirming the presence of miracles in the temporal world. Secondly, the intercession of Gregory serves to set Leo Badis straight, after he had been tempted by the devil, and so this act further enhances the authority of bishops as a whole. Fighting heresy Gregory's avowed aim in writing this book was to fire others with that enthusiasm by which the saints deservedly climbed to heaven, though this was not his sole purpose and he most surely did not expect his entire audience to show promise of such piety as to witness the power of God flowing through them in the way that it did for the fathers. More immediate concerns were at the forefront of his mind as he sought to create a further layer of religious commitment, not only to the church at Rome, but to local churches and cathedrals throughout Gaul, along with his other books, notably The Glory of the Confesses, The Glory of the Martyrs and The Life of Saint. Martin, meticulous attention is paid to the local as opposed to the universal Christian experience. Within these grandiloquent lives are tales and anecdotes which tie miracles, saints and their relics to a great diversity of local areas, furnishing his audience with greater knowledge of their local shrine, and providing them with evidence of the work of God in their immediate vicinity, thus greatly expanding their connection with an understanding of their faith. Attacks on heresy also appear throughout his hagiographies, and Arianism is taken to be the common face of heresy across Europe, exposed to great ridicule. Often, the scenes which expose the weaknesses of heresy focus on images of fire and burning, whilst the Catholics approved right by the protection lavished on them by God. This was of great relevance to Gregory himself as he presided over the important See of Tours, where extensive use was made of the cult of Saint Martin in establishing the authority of the bishopric with the congregation and in the context of the Frankish Church. Gregory's hagiography was an essential component of this. However, this should not be seen as a selfish grab for power on behalf of the bishops who emerged so triumphantly from the life of the fathers but rather as a bid for hegemony of doctrine and control over the practice of worship, which they believed to be in the best interests of their congregation and the wider church. Gregory's creed is an example of Gregory's zeal in his fight against heresy. The Historia Francorum includes a declaration of faith with which Gregory aimed to prove his orthodoxy with respect to the heresies of his time. The confession is in many phrases, each of which refutes a specific Christian heresy. Thus Gregory's creed presents, in the negative, a virtual litany of heresies. I believe, then, in God the Father Omnipotent. I believe in Jesus Christ his only Son, our Lord God, born of the Father, not created. I believe, that he has always been with the Father, not only since time began but before all time. For the Father could not have been so named unless he had a Son, and there could be no Son without a Father. But as for those who say, there was a time when he was not, note, a leading belief of Arian Christology, I reject them with curses, and call men to witness that they are separated from the Church. I believe that the word of the Father by which all things were made was Christ. I believe that this word was made flesh and by its suffering the world was redeemed, and I believe that humanity, not deity, was subject to the suffering. I believe that he rose again on the third day, that he freed sinful man, that he ascended to heaven, that he sits on the right hand of the Father, that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son, that it is not inferior and is not of later origin, but is God, equal and always co-eternal with the Father and the Son, consubstantial in its nature, equal in omnipotence, equally eternal in its essence, 
and that it has never existed apart from the Father and the Son and is not inferior to the Father and the Son. I believe that this Holy Trinity exists with separation of persons, and one person is that of the Father, another that the Son, another that of the Holy Spirit. And in this Trinity confess that there is one deity, one power, one essence. I believe that the Blessed Mary was a virgin after the birth as she was a virgin before. I believe that the soul is immortal but that nevertheless it has no part in deity. And I faithfully believe all things that were established at Nicaea by the 318 bishops. But as to the end of the world I hold beliefs which I learned from our forefathers, that Antichrist will come first. An Antichrist will first propose circumcision, asserting that he is Christ. Next he will place his statue in the temple at Jerusalem to be worshipped. Just as we read that the Lord said, You shall see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, but the Lord himself declared that that day is hidden from all men saying, But of that day and that hour knoweth no one not even the angels in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father alone. Moreover we shall here make answer to the heretics. Note. The Arians, who attack us, asserting that the Son is inferior to the Father since he is ignorant of this day. Let them learn then that Son here is the name applied to the Christian people, of whom God says, I shall be to them a father and they shall be to me for sons, for if he had spoken these words of the only begotten son he would never have given, the angels first place, for he uses these words, not even the angels in heaven nor the son, showing that he spoke these words not of the only begotten but of the people of adoption, but our end is Christ himself, who will graciously bestow eternal life on us if we turn to him, importance. The Historia Francorum is of salient historical interest since it describes a period of transition from Roman to medieval, and the establishment of the Frankish state, the area of which, despite numerous fluctuations, was to remain large in terms of population and territory, and fortunate in terms of resources and wealth, throughout the medieval period, despite divisions that formed as the modern map of Europe evolved. The motivation behind his works was to show readers the importance and strength of Christianity. His extensive literary output is itself a testimony to the preservation of learning and to the lingering continuity of Gallo-Roman civic culture. Through the early Middle Ages, 